Well, if you have a Bible with you today, please open to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 1. Today, I want to talk to you about the greatest advice from the greatest mother, the greatest advice from the greatest mother. Today, as Phil said, is Mother's Day, and we are so thankful and grateful for all of our moms. Whenever I think of Mother's Day, it reminds me of the story of a little boy. His name was Billy. He was just in first grade, and in uh, the church that he went to, they had this uh, program on the life of Jesus, and different classes were assigned to do different scenes in the life of Jesus. And his little first grade class uh, was assigned to do a scene where Jesus is in the temple and he says, I am the light of the world. And so little Billy, uh, his job was to be Jesus in that scene, a pretty important role. He had just one line and it was the line, I am the light of the world. And so he began to practice and practice when he was having breakfast. I am the light of the world. When he was having lunch, I am the light of the world. When he was having dinner, I am the light of the world. When he was in the car, I am the light of the world. When he was playing in the backyard, I am the light of the world. When he was on the potty, I am the light of the world. Everywhere he was, I am the light of the world. I am the light until he got that line down in his head. Well, the night of the program, he walks out onto the stage. He had never seen so many people out there in all of his life. He was petrified. He was so afraid the words just wouldn't come out of his mouth. But there was his mom. She was sitting down on the front row. She was trying to coach him along. And she kept whispering, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And he was just so afraid. And finally, little Billy blurts out, my mom is the light of the world. And I'm scared to death. (laughs) My mom is the light of the world. Now, we know that's not true. But for many of us, our mom is so important. And moms are wise. Moms know a lot about a lot of things. And the reason why they know a lot about a lot of things is they've learned a lot of things by experience. They've learned a lot of things the hard way. I recently saw a piece by a mother in Austin, Texas. And she writes a series of things that she learned by being a mother. Number one, when you hear the toilet flush and the words, "Uh uh-oh, it's already too late. (laughs) Number two, certain Legos will pass through the digestive tract of a (laughs) four-year-old. Another thing she learned as a mother, the glass in the patio window is not strong enough to stop a baseball hit by a ceiling fan. Another thing I learned as a mother, Play-Doh and the microwave should not be used in the same sentence. Another thing, PBJ, PB&J sandwiches will not come out of a CD player no matter how many times you push the eject button. Then she writes, another thing I learned as a mom, stabbing a screwdriver into a king-size waterbed will fill a 2,000-foot square foot house four inches deep in water. And finally, she says, I learned this as a mother. If you hook a dog leash over a ceiling fan, the motor is not strong enough to rotate a 42-pound boy wearing Batman underwear and a Superman cape. I love it. Moms are smart. Really, really smart. But I want to talk to you about the smartest mother in the world and the greatest advice that she gave. The wisest mother in the world and the wisest counsel she gave. Who is the greatest mother in the world? Well, according to the Bible, it is a woman named Mary. We do not worship Mary, but we do honor her because she had the amazing privilege of being the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in Luke chapter 1, we read about how she was to be the most blessed among women. 
In Luke chapter 1 and verse 26, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee to a place called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among all of the women who have ever lived on the planet. Blessed are you. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be? since I know not a man. And the angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born of you will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called, called barren. For with God, nothing, will be impossible. Then Mary said, oh, I like this. Behold, the servant of the Lord. Behold, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Many Bible commentators believe that Mary was the age of a middle school student in our day, 12 to 15 years old. And here she is. I'm just your servant, God. Whatever you want to do in my life, that's, that's fine. Behold, the servant of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. The angel departed for her. Now Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste to the city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe, John the Baptist, leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she spoke out with a loud voice, and she said, Blessed are you among women. <laughs> of all of the women in human history, of all of the women in the world, you are blessed, Mary. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your Greeting sounded in my ears. The babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, oh, I like this. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. The Roman Catholics say that Mary was sinless. She was not. She was not. She needed a Savior just like you and me. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly estate of his servant. For behold, henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. Of all the women in the world, of all of the women in history, I have this privilege of being blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things. And holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Who is the greatest mother in human history? According to the Bible right here, of all of the mothers there have ever been, Mary. If Mary could be here today, if the greatest mother in the world, if the greatest mother in human history could be here today, what would her advice be to you? What would her advice be to me? Well, I believe the answer to that question is found in the Gospel of John in John 
chapter 2. Look there for a moment. You know, it is interesting, Mary, such a godly and important woman in the Bible and in history. As you read through the Bible, there's not many words that Mary spoke. (laughs) You would think that there would be some long statement that she said, but other than what we just read that Mary said, there's only one other place you actually read the words of Mary. And it's found in John chapter 2 in a very interesting account. In John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The third day of what? The third day after Jesus began his public ministry. He had been baptized in water, and John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Three days later, after Jesus is announced as the Lamb of God, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Many Bible teachers believe that since Mary is mentioned first, she may have been the hostess of this particular wedding. And then Jesus and the disciples happened to be there as well. And they, it says in verse 3, And they ran out of wine, and the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Weddings in that day, in any day, they're a big deal. But in that day, they were an especially big deal. They would have a celebration that would go on for many days. And there was a lot of food. There was a lot of drink that happened there. And they ran out of wine. Now, we don't have time to go into a detailed teaching, but people say, oh, Jesus drank wine, so I can drink wine. Let me just, I wish I could give a whole teaching on it. I can't do that. The word that's translated wine here is a very interesting word. Most of the time, it has to do with unfermented grape juice, unless the context clearly says that it does have to do with fermented grape juice. Later, when it talks about The best wine, that phrase was used by the the Romans for the first, the very first pressing of the grapes, a very sweet and delicious juice. But even if the word has to do with fermented wine, do you know in the days of Jesus that the wine was always diluted with water? At the Passover, the Jews, they drank a cup of wine as a part of it. Do you know, according to the Jewish Talmud, it was to be mixed with three parts water to one part wine? In fact, the old Mishnah used to say, you can't even say the the prayer of blessing over that cup until it's diluted. Do you know in ancient times that Homer talked about a wine that was eight parts water to one part wine? Plato talked about 20 parts water to one part wine. To the Romans and to the Greeks, to drink undiluted wine, listen, was barbaric. The wine of our day, the beer of our day, check it out on your own. Research it on your own. They would say much of the alcohol that we have in our day was barbaric. It was strong drink. So when it says they ran out of wine, not the kind of wine you're thinking about, but here is the mother of Jesus. And she says to Jesus, they ran out of wine. Listen, in that culture, that was a major embarrassment. And here, not only would it embarrass the couple, but here is Mary. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Somebody says, ah, he called her woman and not mother. (laughs) He's being disrespectful to his mom. Okay, again, that's not the case. What in that time was like saying ma'am in our culture. If you're down, if anyone's from down in the south, they'll tell you if there's someone who's older than you, even your mother, you call them ma'am. Ma'am. Ma'am, he says. Woman, what concern does that have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Verse 5, And his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. 
6 times 20 or 30, 120 to 180 gallons. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim, all the way to the top. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water that was made into wine, he did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. And the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, the very sweetest, the very best. And when the guests are well drunk, when they have drunk all of that, then the inferior. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the beginning of signs. The first miracle that Jesus did. He did it in Canaan of Galilee and he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. I want you to focus on verse 5. Whether you realize it or not, that is a very important verse. Do you know in the Bible, verse 5 records for us the last words Mary, the mother of Jesus, ever spoke. I'm sure in the course of her life, she must have spoken many other words, but they are not recorded for us in the Bible. The greatest mother the last words recorded for us in this book, you ought to have underlined in your Bible. You ought to have a star by it in your Bible. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. I believe if Mary, the mother of Jesus, the greatest mother in human history, if she could be here today, and give you the greatest, the most wise counsel, the most wise advice, it would be, do what Jesus tells you to do. Just do what Jesus tells you to do. Brandon calls me. He says, Pastor Larry, I'm feeling real sick. Could you, could you give a Mother's Day message? And I just began to pray. Lord, what would you want to say to Regenerate Church? Not only on Mother's Day. But what would you want to say to them on their last Mother's Day at Triangle Square? What would you want to say to them on the last day, the last Sunday, that they meet in the theater at Triangle Square? I begin to pray, and the Lord put this on my heart. He said, go down there and tell them what Mary said. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do that. Do that. As you go from this place to the next place in your journey, as a church, hear the wise counsel of Mary. Do what Jesus tells you to do. Now, I wish we had weeks to tell you everything Jesus said to do. <laughs> as you read the Gospels, there are many, many things that Jesus commanded us to do, that Jesus told us to do. There's no mistake that this is at the very beginning of the Gospel of John because as you read on in the Gospel of John, you begin to read so many things that Jesus said to do. And what you and I are to do is to do what Jesus said to do. As I was praying about our time together, I just felt so impressed to mention three things Jesus has told us to do. I felt so impressed to remind you, Regenerate Church, as you go from this place to the next place. Three things Jesus said to do. You might want to write them down. A first thing he told us to do is found over in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 15, and that is to abide in him. Look in John 15 for a moment. Here's a first thing Jesus told us to do. In John 15, verse 4 and verse 5, Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Regenerate church, 
as you go from this place to the next place, do what Jesus says. Abide in him. Because without him, listen, you won't do anything. You won't accomplish anything. You can organize all you want. You can strategize all you want. And nothing is going to happen unless you every single day, moment by moment, abide in Jesus. Say, Pastor Larry, how do I do that? So simple. Through the word, through prayer, through fellowship. That's how you abide in him. Through the word, you think his thoughts as you're in his word, in his word, in his word, in his word. Ten years ago, I got a call from a professor over at Vanguard University. Some of you I know have been students over there, students of a, a gal named Sherry Benvenuti, and she called me 10 years ago, and she said, my mom just died. Her mom, a great and godly woman, Charlene Benvenuti. She said, I want you, Pastor Larry, I want you to do the service. So we did the service right over here at Newport Mesa Christian Center 10 years ago. And I remember sitting down with Sherry, and I said, well, what, what do you want me to say about your mother? What do I say about your mother? I'll never forget what happened. She reached down and she picked up a Bible and she shoved it across the desk. She said, just look in my mom's Bible. It will tell you everything you need to know. Can I just tell you one of the most honoring, wonderful experiences of my life was going through that mother's Bible. Something about a mother's Bible. It was so precious. When I looked through all the verses underlined and all the notes written there, how do you abide in Jesus? Abide in his word. You're just in his word every single day in your devos. Listen, as you go, do what Jesus said to do. Abide in his word. And you abide, listen, you abide in him, not only through the word, but through prayer. Just communing with him, communing with him, communing with him. You say, we're too busy. I don't have time for all of that. <laughs> Let me talk to you about another mother. Two great preachers in church history, John and Charles Wesley. They were what they were and said what they said, in part, to their godly mother, Susanna. She was the mother of 19 children. So how, do, how do you find time to abide in Jesus? <laughs> how do you find time to pray <laughs> when you have 19 kids? <laughs> well, she had a very interesting practice, you know, because... She like lived in the kitchen almost. She wore an apron and she just had told her kids. She said, if you ever walk in and you see mama's apron up over the top of her head, don't bother me. <laughs> she said, I'm, I'm talking to Jesus. I'm talking to Jesus. Prayer. Someone wrote, whisper a prayer in the morning. Whisper a prayer at noon. Whisper a prayer in the evening to keep your heart in tune. God answers prayer in the morning. God answers prayer at noon. God answers prayer in the evening. So keep your heart in tune. Regenerate church, do what Jesus said to do. And that is abide in him through worship, through prayer, and fellowship together. But there's another thing Jesus said to do, and I want to remind you of that. And that's in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. For most of you, all you have to do is just turn your Bible back one page. In John 13, verse 34 and 35, Mary said, do what he says to do. Here's another thing to do. Verse 34, John chapter 13. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, so also you should love one another. By this will all men know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The second thing that Jesus said to do is not only abide in him, but to love one another. Not only to love him, but to love each other. Interesting. You can go back later. He says, love one another as I have loved you. And when you read the whole chapter, it begins with Jesus. 
getting down to wash the dirty feet of the disciples. Such humility. Such service. Later on, Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. Oh, regenerate church as you go from this place to the next place. Love one another. Mothers are a good example of abiding in Jesus. Mothers are a good example of loving one another. <clears throat> Indeed, the love of the mother is one of the greatest loves of all. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what happens in your life, your mom loves you. And the, the way your mom has loved you is the way God loves you, is the way you ought to love others. Many years ago, in South Wales, there was a mother with a small baby, and she was going from one village to the next village. And as she was walking along, she got caught in a horrible blizzard, a snowstorm. And it was, it was snowing so much she could hardly see in the front of her, and she was just engulfed. She was overcome by the blizzard. And the people that were waiting for her in the next village, they didn't, she didn't come, she didn't come, she didn't come. She didn't come. And finally, after the blizzard subsided, after the snowstorm blew along, they went to look for her. And they found her. There she was under a mound of snow. She'd taken off almost all of her clothes. She had wrapped them around her little baby. And then she shielded the body of that little baby with herself. Amazingly. The mother was dead, but when they pulled all of the clothing off of that little baby, the baby was still alive. That little baby, his name was David Lloyd George. And that little baby became the prime minister of England. The love of a mother. Jesus said, love one another. As I have loved you, as your mother has loved you, as mothers do love you, love one another. But there's a third command. There's a third thing Jesus told us to do. I want you to just look at it, a third and final thing. In Mark chapter 16, look there for a moment. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, another passage that ought to be underlined in your Bible. So simple and so important. And Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world. Share the love of God. Share the good news of Jesus. Share the gospel with every single person you meet. Do what Jesus has to do. That's the place of blessing. That's the path of blessing. To go into all the world and preach the gospel. Regenerate church as you go from this location to the next location. Do what Jesus said. Begin to just share with all the people there in Westminster and around that church. and Down into Huntington Beach and up into Buena Park. Just begin to share the gospel with all of those that, listen, that's what your mom would want you to do. <laughs> that's what good mothers do. One of the greatest preachers in church history was a man named G. Campbell Morgan. You can find his commentaries in many Bible colleges or seminaries. G. Campbell Morgan. And he had seven children, four sons <laughs> and three daughters. And amazingly, all four of his sons became pastors. He was a great preacher. And his sons were great preachers. They were at a family gathering one time, and they had invited some guests, and they were just talking about their family and how amazing it was that God would use not only Dr. Morgan, but his sons as well. And they were talking to the youngest of the sons. His name was Howard. 
And they said to him, you know, you're a, you're a good preacher and your brothers are pre- good preachers and your dad's a good preacher. And they asked him, they said, yeah, who do you think is the best preacher in the family? He did a bad and I and smiled. He said, my mother. <laughs> my mother. She had taught them. Share the good news. And they were sharing the good news. The greatest advice from the greatest mother. Pastor Brendan sick today, so you got stuck with me. (laughs) But if Mary, the mother of Jesus, were standing right here, I really believe the last, her last words recorded in the Bible are the greatest things you could ever hear, not only today, but the rest of your life. Do what Jesus tells you. Just do what Jesus tells you. If you will do what Jesus tells you, miracles will happen. Just like that first miracle. Every time you read through the Bible, every time you read in history, when people just did what Jesus told them to do, miracles happen. And Regenerate Church, I believe as you go from this place to the next place, if you will abide in him, if you will love one another, if you will go and you will share the gospel, then he will do miracles for you too. Not long ago I found a a short article I just want to finish with today it was written by a pastor. His name is Harry Salem. And it's called My My Mother and Jesus. He writes, I will never forget the day the eviction notice was served. We had lost our farm. That was the one thing we had prayed would not happen. But the drought years of the 1930s in western uh, South Dakota had won. My father a Lebanese immigrant whom my mother had taught to read and write was not a believer, but my mother had a deep, deep love for Jesus. Jesus will help us, she said. Jesus will help us. Yet there we were 30 days from being homeless and penniless, but my mother never doubted. She just kept on loving and believing in Jesus. She continually sang about him, She cared for her five children and labored in our farm home that had neither running water nor electricity. And sure enough, mom was right. But we lost that farm. Dad found another farm better than the one we lost. And some years later, dad found something much more important. He found Jesus as his own Savior and Lord because of my mother. He writes, it has always impressed me as it does now more than 60 years later that Jesus was so absolutely real to my mother. In her 99th year, her memory was gone, but not her faith. She could no longer remember even the names of her husband or her children. But when someone asked, do you remember Jesus? her dim eyes would brighten and she would exclaim, Jesus? Oh, yes, I know Jesus. Do what Jesus tells you to do. He says, I'm a pastor and I've been preaching about this wonderful Jesus for 53 years. But the greatest message is not the one I have preached or even the one I have heard preached. The greatest message is the one I saw lived out in my godly mother. How awesome. I like her words. Oh, Jesus, I remember him. Just do what Jesus would tell you to do on this Mother's Day. I think that's the greatest advice anyone could ever hear. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this message today. We thank you for all of these mothers here. Thank you for all of the mothers in history, all of the mothers in the Bible. And we thank you, Lord, especially for Mary. She didn't see herself as anything great or special, just the servant of the Lord who is so humble and submissive. Lord, just whatever you want to do in my life, I'm open to it. 
We thank you, Lord, for these powerful, simple, unforgettable words of Mary. On this Mother's Day and in the days ahead, Lord, we pray we would think about them, meditate on them, but most important, that we would heed them.